Today we're talking about what an avoidance idea of a healthy relationship actually looks like. And I've always found that there's kind of this interesting disconnect that goes on between the average person when they're dating an avoidant and some of the things that they're doing. Because oftentimes when you're in a relationship with an avoidant, the things they're doing, the, the way they're acting, the breakups that occur, the avoidant looks at this as actually a healthy relationship, but you look at it as a very unhealthy one. And so I'm going to try to bridge the gap between the two. So in this video, you're going to learn about the avoidant disconnect. You're going to learn about something I've been calling the self-fulfilling cycle of the avoidant when they go from relationship to relationship. You're going to learn about why oftentimes avoidants want to be understood, but they don't want to reciprocate understanding onto you. And then finally, we're going to learn about actually how to have a healthy relationship with an avoidant. So let's first talk by the really looking at the avoidant disconnect. So when we refer to avoidance, we're actually talking about a category within sort of the attachment style theory. So according to simply psychology, the attachment styles or the attachment theory is defined as a lasting psychological connectedness between human beings. That was founded by John Bowlby in 1969. And oftentimes it's because considered interchangeable with concepts such as affectional bond or emotional bond. And what's interesting about attachment cells is that a human being's first attachment is often established during infancy with a primary caregiver, like a mother or a father. However, it must be noted that attachment is not unique to infant caregiver relationships. They can also be present in other forms of social relationships. So attachments of various kinds are actually formed through the repeated act of attachment behaviors or attachment transactions. And think of it, it's best to think of it like this continuous process of seeking and maintaining a certain level of proximity to another specific individual. Now, generally speaking, there are really four types of attachment styles. There's people who have secure attachment styles. There's people who have anxious attachment styles, avoidant attachment styles, and fearful attachment styles. But really, we're going to be focusing on the avoidant attachment styles since you were watching this video to understand how they have this warped view of a healthy relationship. So the first thing you really need to understand for an avoidant attachment style is that oftentimes healthy is synonymous with them with comfortable. So for them, when they're looking at a comfortable relationship, being able to have independence within their relationship is key. And this kind of creates this paradox that you'll often hear me talk about on my YouTube videos where they want love, but they don't let you close enough to give them that love. And they'll often cite the lack of independence you're providing them in the confines of whatever relationship, whatever romantic relationship you have as one of the reasons that they want to leave the relationship. And therein lies the disconnect we notice that many of our clients have when they actually start dating and avoid it. They have trouble reconciling why things seem so great at the beginning of a relationship and devolve into one in which their partner is drifting away and almost feel like their partner didn't really care about the time they had together at all. So if you haven't figured it out by now, one of the areas where we're really educated is within breakups. In fact, for the past year, I've been studying avoidance nonstop and how they approach relationships. You can actually look at some of my more recent YouTube videos and get an idea of, wow, Chris is doing a lot of avoidant based breakup videos. One of the things I've noticed about avoidance is they often get caught in this self-fulfilling cycle. Now, before I pull out a graphic and describe what the self-fulfilling cycle is, we need to realize that avoidance often will fall victim to their own programming. So think of it like this. Avoidance are literally programmed to thinking that emotional intimacy should be self-sufficient. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, as children, the avoidant had caretakers that would provide them with all the basic necessities they needed to survive, food, shelter, warmth, but that's where things stopped, which means that from an early age, the avoidant had to learn to self-soothe. Now, fast forward that to adulthood, and you'll find an avoidant has a misunderstanding of what a healthy relationship should look like. They'll often view openness as weakness, and understanding that one fact will help us understand the self-fulfilling cycle that they get caught in. So right here is a graphic that I've talked a lot about on my website, podcast, and YouTube videos, what I call the self-fulfilling cycle of the avoidant. 
And really, it's important to understand that it first starts out with a need of love, but slowly and surely devolves into this avoidance of intimacy. So the more in-depth look, there's kind of eight steps to the cycle. The first one starts out with the avoidant wanting someone to love them. So they find you and date you, and things are great at first. So first two steps, want someone to love them. Second step, they date you, things are great at first. The third step is where eventually your need for open communication and potentially if you have an anxious attachment style, your need for constant reassurance begins to trigger their avoidance side. They start to notice some worrying things. Step four is after they start to noticing these worrying things and say, well, maybe it's just this one time, your behavior or something that you're doing or your need for open communication or being emotionally intimate uh, or vulnerable is causing them to start considering leaving the relationship. Their avoidance side is really getting triggered here. Step five is where they actually leave the relationship. Step six is where they are ecstatic that they left the relationship. Finally, it feels like they got the whole uh, burden of the relationship off their shoulders. Step seven is they begin to feel lonely and they need to find a distraction for that loss, which leads them to step eight, entering the victim mentality and wondering why is this always happening to me? And that leads them right back to where they begin. Why won't someone love me? I want someone to love me. This is often what the life cycle of a avoidant relationship will look like. This is the cycle we found consistently through many of our clients' exes who have broken up with them. We're finding that they go through these cycles. And whatever triggers the avoidant can be different for each individual avoidant. And that's, that's a, it's a thing that I think is often lost for a lot of people. So it all stems from this mentality that the average person really can't comprehend. You don't view relationships in this way that uh, being open and being emotionally intimate and emotionally vulnerable is a sign of weakness, but they do. So when I was researching for this YouTube uh, video, I kind of came across something and it really struck a nerve. So it was someone who commented on a video within YouTube. They gave this really long explanation saying, I'm a dismissive avoidant. I grew up with a narcissistic father and a dependent mother. Uh, you can probably imagine there was a lot of emotional abuse and neglect. Whenever I showed emotions, I, I was shamed and I was too sensitive or hysterical. Self-soothing is my main coping mechanism. Specifically that statement right there really is key to understanding the avoidant. Real quick, I want to say that if you're new to this YouTube channel or you're trying to figure out what you should be doing to get your ex back and you're trying to learn if you even have a chance in your specific circumstance, probably the smartest thing for you to do is actually stop by our website, www.exboyfriendrecovery.com or take our ex recovery chances quiz that can be found at exboyfriendrecovery.com. Now, if you're watching this on YouTube, taking that free quiz is super easy to do. All you have to simply do is look in the description link below this YouTube video and click on the link you see there. It will take you directly to the quiz where you can fill it out and get an easy answer on what you should be doing going forward and overall what your chances look like in your specific situation. All right, so let's get you back to the video. What I find really fascinating about people with avoidant attachment styles is inherently they actually enter a relationship with good intentions. They understand subconsciously or on some level that they need support from other people in relationships and they will take that support, especially during the second phase of the cycle. You know, they start off saying, I want someone to love me. But by the second phase, they found someone and they think, finally, the troubles are over. I found what I'm looking for. But this is why so often at the beginning of the relationship with an avoidant, things can seem really great. But as the relationship grows and becomes deeper and more emotional currency is required, they begin to view you opening up or requiring more of them as a sign of weakness. It feels unnatural to them to do that. After all, they've spent their entire lives self-soothing. So what often happens is that our clients who are in relationships with these avoidants will support the avoidant through difficult times, but when they themselves go through difficult times, the avoidant isn't there to reciprocate. And this behavior becomes more and more prevalent as the relationship becomes more serious, which can be difficult if you don't understand what's going on. You become frustrated, you push harder trying to get the uh, emotional support that you potentially need, which triggers their avoidance side even more, and you just keep pushing and pushing, and they keep pulling away and pulling away. Now, 
What I'm about to say can sometimes be misconstrued by people. So I want to make sure that everyone listening to this and watching this understands that an avoidance view of a healthy relationship is not actually what a healthy relationship should look like. However, it's how they actually view a healthy relationship. So remember that comment that I mentioned just a little bit before where I said, hey, I found this woman. She left a comment. She was a dismissive avoidant. She classified herself as a dismissive avoidant. Well, she said something super interesting. She basically gave word for word her view of what a healthy relationship looks like. And this is just a random comment on someone's YouTube channel that I found struck the nerve that I was looking to strike. So here's word for word what she said. I'm actually really sensitive and emotional, but sometimes dealing with emotionally charged situations can be unbearable, even physically sickening. To get along with us, it's important to not be too accusatory or impulsive, to accept our boundaries and be careful with criticism. Clinginess has a tendency to make us want to run. Don't try to force us to open up. Don't try to force us to be dependable. Take us seriously and be vocal about your needs. Emotional expression and care doesn't come naturally to us. So essentially, the best way to sum up the way an avoidant will view a healthy relationship is that they want to be understood, but want you to take care of yourself. This leaves a lot of people unfulfilled because there's a certain level of reciprocation that's required within relationships that is expected, but the avoidance don't enjoy doing that at all. This, of course, begs the interesting question of how can you get an avoidance to open up to you? And for that, I think I'd like to introduce you to the secure attachment gravity concept. Really, there are two types of attachment style categories. There are the secure categories and there are the insecure categories. Secure categories only has one type of attachment style. That's the secure attachment style. The insecure Uh, category basically has three types of attachment styles, anxious ones, avoidant ones, and fearful ones. Notice how the secure attachment, there aren't any other of these interesting subcategories. It's just secure, secure. That is because the end goal from an attachment theory perspective is that always you're trying to take an insecure attachment style and move it towards being more secure. Of course, you can't simply just change your attachment style alone. You need help. In fact, attachment styles are formed in relationships, maintained in relationships, and reformed in relationships. In other words, you're going to need a relationship to quote-unquote fix your attachment style or work on progressing up the correct way. So when you have someone with an attachment style that is veering a little bit more towards avoidant and that person needs help to turn that attachment style into being more secure ones, that's the question. How do you do that? That's where my concept of secure attachment gravity comes into play. So I've always viewed secure attachment styles as gravity upon which the insecure attachment styles are are just naturally drawn to. Similar to the sort of the solar system and how the planets revolve around the sun and how uh, gravity is this function of uh, the smaller object always kind of sticks to the bigger object. Well, that's kind of the way secure attachments work. Theoretically, if you get into a relate, if you have an avoidant attachment style and the person you're dating has a secure attachment style, if you get into a relationship with that person who has a secure attachment style, you will begin to be led and learn how to be more secure yourself. What's interesting though is this not only applies to attraction forces, it applies to attachment forces. So not only will someone who has an avoidant attachment style be naturally kind of drawn a little bit towards a secure attachment style, they'll also be drawn attachment wise to learn how to reform that attachment style. So it's only being with someone who has a secure attachment style that the avoidant learns some of the secure characteristics that they need. Of course, one of my clients in our private Facebook support group took me to task ask for this. And I found it was interesting enough because she brings up a really good point. So here's basically what she said. This is someone, because I was trying to explain this concept in our private Facebook support group. And she basically said, you know, look, this is my experience from being with secure people as a fearful avoidant. I personally didn't feel it made me more secure. It's just that I didn't get triggered as much to avoid. I feel like those are two different things. And I think it misleads people into thinking that if they are secure, their partner automatically becomes secure. That's not necessarily true. It just prevents triggers, which help a lot in communication. 
the avoidant partner has to analyze their own behavior. Personally, my secure partner of three years did not fix my issues. Questioning my own perception did. Again, this is a comment we received in our private Facebook support group, and I attached it here because there's actually one part I disagree with. We know from research that attachment styles do shift based on your interactions with other attachment styles. However, I think the client is correct in saying that it's not an automatic process. What we tend to see happen is that if you are the secure style in the relationship with an avoidant, your secure tendencies will actually force the avoidant to do the self-analysis required to be aware of some of the avoidant gaps. So to answer your question on potentially how do you have a healthy relationship with an avoidant, it always starts from within and doing what you can from your side. As long as you have secure characteristics, as long as you do what this person is suggesting with regards to not being overbearing or needing constant reassurance, not being clingy, making sure that you understand what's going through them and how emotionally charged situations can make the avoidant sort of feel like it's unbearable to be in. As long as you do that and you have secure tendencies, that will encourage the avoidant person to start doing the self-analysis required to become less avoidant and more secure.